everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. I'm excited about our guest today. Our guest today says your DNA can get a reboot, that there are things in life that possibly you don't have to go through because you have something in you that you may not know. Ian Zaldivar, thank you so much for being with us today. Ooh, it is such a delight and honor to be on your show and to be able to share the glory of God from his word. So Ian, you come <laughs> with us or you come to us all the way from Belize. Oh my word. All right. So I want to start by getting to know you. How did you give your life to the Lord? Because this whole session is about who you are in Christ. So how did you give your life to the Lord? But even before then, were you always a Christian? No, absolutely not. Um, I grew up in a Catholic home. My mom and dad were not just Catholics by name, but practice. So we had the rosary prayed every single day. Um, I grew up in an extremely poor family with uh, 11 siblings. And I had a big problem with God. At five years old, a major problem with God. My mom and dad told us that uh, God loved us. But come Christmas, every Christmas, the neighbors around who had no inclination towards God, their kids would always get good toys for Christmas. And we who were praying the rosary every single day and living a religious life, our toys would always be hand me down. A wheel would be off of, of the car or something like that. And I just had a problem with that. If God loves me, why do I get secondhand stuff and the ones that doesn't love him get the, the good stuff? So I had a problem with God. And at five years old, I remember clearly, I told God, if you can't make life happen for me, I am going to make it happen. And I literally turned away from God in my heart at five years old. So at five years old, you had this knowledge of God. So you believed in God but you didn't believe that he per se cared about you. Yeah, e exactly. Ba based on what I was seeing, my mom and dad were so sacrificial towards God and, and very committed. And, and they were teaching us the same thing, but it was like God was responding in the opposite way. So from five years old, you said you left God at five years old, basically. Yes, in my heart. Well, in your heart. So what did life look for you after that? I mean, how was your how was your adolescence? <laughs> how was your teen years? It, it, it was terrible, actually terrible, because um, I'm looking back now on my life from my childhood. Now I understand it. I didn't understand then. But that day when I told God I wasn't interested in him anymore, I wasn't going to serve him. I was going to make life on my own. Um, I remember that a guy stepped into my life who one day opened a Playboy book before me with completely naked woman in there. And that was the start of a downhill for me in a very, very corrupt, immoral lifestyle. And it was because looking back, I realized it was because I had abandoned God in my heart. I rejected him and the door of the enemy was open. And I th that thing just hooked my heart to where everything in my life was focused around sexual immorality, sexual perversion. And that's all I did as I was growing up secretly. Nobody knew about it, but it, it just ripped my life apart. So how old were you when you first saw that magazine? I was five years old. Oh well, little, I'd, I'd say, let's say six years old, because it was just a short while after I rejected God. Wow. You know, and that shows how, how the Lord respects you because he won't force himself on you. And at the age of five, you obviously knew what you were doing and you experienced what it was like to, for the, like you said, for the Lord to leave you after that, um, you're a teenager. How's your heart towards God as a teen? Okay, so so first of all, let, let me just retract from my teenage years to, to, to about nine years old. I remember at nine years old, and, and this is how I know the Lord called me to a deliverance ministry, to, to a, a Christian life that is not mediocre, but full-fledged in the word of God, believing everything that it says it is. 
When I was about nine years old, I remember I went to a, a, a scout meeting for boys and I saw them doing a cookout and I, it just attracted me. And, and when I went home after that, I lighted a, a, a fire myself, but being nine years old, I didn't know that gasoline and kerosene was different. And I found a gallon of, of gasoline that my dad had. I put some sticks together and I saturated the sticks with it. And then I found the gasoline, saturated it. And I, as the moment I lit the match, the fumes, the whole things just exploded in my face, burnt up my whole head. All my hair was gone. My lip was singed. My eyebrows, everything was gone. I managed to out the fire in a bucket of water that I found and I heard the sizzling. So my mom at that time, even though she was a Catholic, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and a word of prophecy came out and the prophecy said this, the devil wanted to kill you, but I sent my angel to stop him. Remember at that age, I, I didn't understand all of that, but now looking back, I could see that the devil wanted to kill me before God could get his hand on my life to use me. So from there going up into my teenage years, I became an ugly person. I, I, can I be raw just for a little bit? Absolutely. I was in whorehouses every weekend of my life with whores all over the place. Um, I learned how to become a person that had lots of money by professional stealing. What do I mean by that? I never jumped through a person's window to steal from them, but I got hired for the airlines, the international airlines. And quickly I learned, I saw ways how I could make money and steal the company. And this happened over and over again because I worked for American Airlines, for Continental. I, I worked for Eastern Airlines back then, all, some major airlines. And, and every time I learned how to just make money and to steal. So I started very low. They hired me as a baggage manager or, or, or yeah, baggage manager. And I would jump into these big cargo airlines uh, bins. And, and it started with one day when, when we opened the bin, there was several suitcases popped open because of turbulence. And we found all kinds of things in there. We found envelope with money. We found all kinds of expensive clothing. And that wouldn't mean anything to you up there. But here in Belize, uh, people are, are are poor. So when we saw these things, when I saw these things, this was a way to make money. So when the plane would land again and, and all the suitcases were intact and nothing was torn, we would tear the suitcases open and we would take what was in there for ourselves and just have the airline pay it back to the to, to the people. And and you know, here's the funny thing about all of this. The, the more wicked I became, it seems like the more blessed I was mm. because, because I was stealing and yet my, my manager from the airline would come to me and say to me, we see that you're a very hardworking individual. We want to give you a promotion. And they would promote me to a ticketing agent. When I became a ticketing, ticketing agent, I... Again, immediately found out that I could make money by having all these North American folks bumped up to first class and I would take the money because back then security was very, very low. They would have coach class. I would bump them up to first class and the difference in money, which was a few hundred dollars, I would take for myself. And I tell you, I would have a couple thousand dollars in my pocket every single day. And I would go with my friends and I would drink and party and just pay for all of the drinking and the party and sleep around with whores just several times a week, you know. So the Lord really released me so that I could find myself. And that was my life all through my teenage years. Now, let me just mention this quickly. I really meant when I told God, if he can't make my life happen, I would make it happen. And well, now I know it was bad news, but the good news was I ended up making my life happen. I had two vehicles completely paid for. I was renting a huge house 
uh, uh, with my wife in there and I had all kinds of appliances and equipment and stuff in there and money in my pocket. I had made my life happen. Now, after that, simultaneously, though I had made my life happen financially, materially, I came home one day and my wife said to me, I'm going to leave you. I said, but why? She said, because you're not the person I knew when I got married to you. And you're never around. You're never around our child. You're never around me. And I, I, I'm just out of this. And I loved my wife. But I knew I had all these issues and I didn't know how to make them work together and stuff like that. And by the way, in the very first year of my marriage, I committed adultery. I was unfaithful to my wife. She didn't learn of that until 10 years later when the Holy Spirit was really working in my life and I had to confess. My life was on a downward spiral when it came to my family, my wife, my child, uh, God, but I was doing well financially. So there was a side that I really love, but then I really loved my wife and I didn't know how to make it work. So one day when I came home from my work, my wife said to me, I heard that there is an evangelist that's coming. At this time, I wasn't living on the island. I was living in Belize city. And she told me, um, I heard there's an evangelist coming to town and I really want to go. Now I didn't tell her this. I said this to me. I said, here is the perfect way to show my wife that I love her. I don't need God, but I'm going to go with her just to show her I love her. So I told her, I said, let's go. I'm going to go with you. And so we went there. And when we were there, the, the evangelist, I think, passed away a couple of years ago. His name was Laverne Tripp. And anyway, we went to that evangelistic meeting in Belize City and we were sitting there, the, the choir sang their songs and the preacher preached his sermon. And at the end, he gave an altar call and my wife touched me with her elbow and she said, they're giving an altar call to receive Jesus. I want to go again. I didn't tell her this. I said this within me. Here's another opportunity to show her that I really love her. So I said, let's go. I'm going to go. But I didn't go to that makeshift altar for me. I, I was a Catholic. I was taught that that if I did some good while I'm bad, things are going to work out. And so I, I didn't need this Jesus that they were preaching about. But I went with her to the altar. Let me tell you, God is a merciful God. When I went to that makeshift altar, I didn't have my mind on God. I, I didn't know I could have a personal walk with God. The moment I stepped to that makeshift altar, and there were about 200 people there with me. My wife was there. I was there and other folks. The moment I, I went to that altar, all of a sudden, two things happened simultaneously. God's glory came down upon me. And for the first time in my life, nobody had to tell me I was a filthy, filthy, dirty sinner. I felt it. I felt the weight of my sin. I felt condemned. But at the same time, I actually, for the very first time in my life, felt the warm embrace of God saying, I love you. I didn't know what happened after that. I blocked out on the ground. My brother told me I was down on that ground for about 20 minutes, weeping, weeping, weeping. God was doing a major cleansing in my heart. And when I got up from the ground, I opened my eyes and I cannot lie to you. I don't even have words to explain it, but the world was no longer the same. I opened my eyes and I, I actually saw life, the world, everything around me in a different way. We went home that night and I told my wife, I said, honey, I never want to drink, smoke, party, sleep around again. I never want anything to do with the world. And I meant that from my heart. And you know what? 30 Five years later, I have never, ever been the same. 
wow. So you quit smoking, drinking, sleeping around all this stuff. Okay. So question for you though, when you went to the altar, did you anticipate anything happening or did you go with an earnest heart to maybe something will happen or it was just to please your wife? It was just to please my wife. I didn't need God. I didn't want God. I thought I had a part of God and that was enough for me. But you know, the Bible says I was found by those who were not looking for me. That's my life. I wasn't looking for God at that altar. I, I was just going there so that my wife can do what she wants to do. But God had other plans. So you were completely healed from your transgressions not even asking for it. So it was a gift from the Lord. It was an absolute undeserved gift from God because I surely didn't deserve it. I didn't want him, but he had other plans. And I walked away from there. I'm telling you completely transformed. Now I need to mention something else. Can I? Absolutely. When, when I got born again that day, a hunger for the word of God resided inside of me. But but that hunger led me to open God's word. And I, I, I read it and read it, but I didn't understand anything at all. So when, when I accepted Christ that night, a lot of things started to happen. Number one, I lost my job. I lost my job for something I didn't do. I had done a lot of rottenness in all my working career. And if the airline had told me a million and one things that I did, they probably would have been right. But they came to me and told me something I never did. And that's being frankly honest. And the only reason I never did it is because I never got the opportunity. They came and told me that I'm, I'm, I'm peddling drugs. And I didn't. I remember I had several people that came to me and asked me if I could transport drugs on the airline. And I said, yes, but for some reason, it never worked out. So they fired me for something I never did. And it kind of hurted me. I lost my job. I, I was now born again. I didn't understand anything. And when I lost my job, it didn't matter where I applied. No one hired me at all. And I had to question myself. Is this Jesus that I accepted the right decision for my life or did I do something wrong because everything was going wrong? I lost my job. I had to go on my wife's farm, her mom and dad's farm, and I ate off their own food for a year without having a dollar in my pocket. But the Lord was remaking me and I didn't know it. I was an angry man for that first year of my born again experience because I knew nothing of how God worked and no one could tell me. And so anyway, after that year of having no job, my brother who worked for the telephone company called me one day and he said, I have a job for you. And I said, wow, that sounds good. He says, it's on the island of San Pedro. I said, well, I've never been there. He says, well, I have a job for you. He says, the pay is not good, but maybe it's a good start. I said, well, how much is the pay? He said, well, you're going to be paid $630 a month. I had a couple thousand dollars in my pocket every day. Do you know what a slap in the face $630 was? But anyway, I was so deeply frustrated. I told him, you know what? I'm going to take this job just for a couple of months because I really need to do something. So I came out to the island without my wife, without my child. She stayed back with her mom and dad. And I started working. And when I came out here, I was invited to a Catholic charismatic meeting. Now, don't get excited about that because it's not really charismatic the way we would think. But anyway, they invited me to the meeting. And I, I told God, young, immature, ignorant Christian, I told God, God, I'm going to go to this meeting for one reason. I want somebody to preach this book to me because I don't understand anything. So I went there that night. And when I went there, there was about eight people, including myself. And the guy, the leader, opened the Bible at random, opened to where it spoke about Paul's shipwreck. He closed it back. And then he looked around and he said, does anybody have anything to share? The least thing I wanted to hear was a shipwreck. My life was already a shipwreck. Anyway, 
Nobody had anything to share, not even him. Well, I tell you, I walked away from that little meeting that night, crying, tears rolling down my eye. I went into my little room, angry, angry at God. And I said to God, God, you knew this would happen before it happened. Why did you even let me go to this meeting? And again, God in his mercy, I heard his audible voice. This is not just in my spirit. An audible voice said to me, why don't you ask to interpret the word? I said, God, if this is possible, I would like to. Instantly, the moment I said that, right through the roof and the ceiling of my room, a brilliant light came over me, brighter than the sun at noonday, and I fell asleep. When I woke up the following morning and I opened the Bible again, I ate that book daily. Everything I read, I understood from darkness to light. And I consumed the Bible for months and months, Genesis to Revelation over and over. And boy, what a delight it was. And there was where the Lord actually called me into ministry. Wow. So that's how it all started. Well, I have a few questions for you, Ian. Okay. Uh, I want to go way back to when you said, yeah. this is because I know some people, when they heard this, they were like, oh gosh, what do I do? So when you said that you were on the airline and, you know, Dawn Turbulence luggages would open, what would you encourage people who heard that? and was like, I, yikes, I'm traveling, you know, um, how do I secure my things? I know this is kind of off topic, but <laughs> how would they secure their things? Would you believe that putting a lock on their luggage would be better? Um, doing travel or what do you think? Only because you said that you guys would take stuff out. And I know some people um, may be traveling soon. Yeah. Well, in, in all honesty, I, I, I can only address this from a Christian perspective now because I've worked for the airlines for such a long time. And I know that it doesn't matter if you have 10 padlocks on your suitcase, sometimes because uh, of of the, the packing in, in the bin of the airline, it, it is so congested and, and turbulences come, they're still open anyway. So my my simple advice would be, if you are a believer, you just pray over your stuff before <laughs> right. you leave. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. So good advice. Awesome advice. So um, I want to go to when you said that you became prosperous though in your finances when you were away from God. You had thousands of dollars in your pocket per day. So do you believe that the devil allowed that to happen for you or provided that to happen for you so you would keep doing what you're doing, making you believe that you're on the right track? Yes, it was the enemy. And of course, God allowed it to happen because he had to bring me to the end of myself. But it was the devil. You know, the devil ma makes people rich in this world. And, and I was one of them that he was doing that too. And, and the reason he was doing it, he, he had me on the list for hell for sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then when you said that you were, you know, Catholic growing up, did your family believe in being born again or did the church you went to, did they believe in being born again? No, no, no. Uh, -uh. uh, let, let me, let me quickly see if I can explain this to you. My, my mom and my dad were Catholics. They, they loved God, but they believed in all the idols and 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 the, the the way Catholics do things. But one day there was another Pentecostal preacher. I was a young, young boy at this time again. And I remember that my mom and dad went to this Pentecostal meeting they had. This was in the capital called Beldmopan. And I remember they, they gave their lives to Jesus there because they heard the word. And, and something happened that I don't see in today's generation. I know it still happens, but I haven't seen it. My mom was water baptized after accepting Jesus. And when she came up out of the water of water baptism, she was also spirit baptized, came up speaking in tongues. And... The preacher gave them an ultimatum. He said, 
It is time for you to leave the Catholic Church, to find a good Bible-believing church, and to walk with the Lord faithfully. Sadly, my mom and dad passed away at 90 years old. They're now in heaven because they were born again. But sadly, they never took the offer. They never took the advice. They remained in the Catholic Church. And in my opinion, I say this respectfully to my parents because I love them. Things never went well. It, they, they never got out of the bondage because the opportunity was given and they didn't take it. Well, so the they were born. Yes, they were born again, but stayed in the bondage. Hmm. And what was the bondage? The bondage was continue praying the rosary, continue praying hmm. to Mary, continue believing and praying to the saints, remained poor, uh, all their lives uh, because these idols, I think there's an association. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church, their teachings holds you in the bondage of po poverty for the most part. We have a lot of Catholics who watch this channel and a question they often have is, you know, we don't worship these statues. We just pray to, um, you know, the saints. What's wrong with that? So could you explain why that it was not okay to pray to the saints? Okay, so so even let's just say even if they weren't even praying to the saints, they they were just believing in Jesus. Your association with the root of ungodly practices kind of binds you to the exact same thing. The Bible teaches that. So, but but praying to the saints is completely inaccurate. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to pray to the Father. There's no other omniscient being but the Lord our God. So praying to saints really is not praying to saints. It's praying to demons. And I'm not judging or condemning. That's just reality. That's what the Bible teaches. So when you said that you heard the voice of God, what did his voice sound like? Did it sound like a voice of many waters? Did it sound like a baritone voice? Did he sound like a tenor? What did God's voice sound like? I think because I was only a one-year-old Christian, ignorant as hell at that time, full of myself, I think God had to speak to me the way he did for me to understand that it was him. His voice sounded deeply manly. I think if he had spoken to me in biblical terms, like the sound of many waters or a wind or something, I would have missed it. I wouldn't have known it because I wasn't biblically sound at that time. So his voice sounded manly. It's so interesting you say that because I heard the voice of God twice in exactly what you said. He sounded very masculine, very masculine, very manly. That's how I heard him too. So I'm glad you said that. Um, and before we get to the DNA, I just want to touch on one more thing that you said, um, how you needed the Lord to interpret the Bible for you. And there goes religion and people, a lot of Christians don't understand a difference between religion and relationship. And we have a lot of Christians who know the Bible, but don't know how to interpret it, or it's not interpreted for them by Holy Spirit. So could you explain to those watching who may religiously read the Bible, but not understand it the way that Holy Spirit wants to give it to us. Could you just explain, because there's a lot of uh, those who have religion in their heart, but not understanding that there's so much more if you were able to understand the word from God's standpoint. Yes. Well, it's, it's impossible to be in a relationship with the Lord without understanding his word, reading his word, because uh, that's his will. That, that's how we get to know him, his nature, his character, his will for our lives. Um, but not being able to understand, first of all, if I, I truly believe if someone is truly born again, number one, there is an experience. It's not just a thing where, okay, I prayed the sinner's prayer and the pastor told me I'm born again. I personally believe based on scripture, that if you are genuinely born again, you should have had, even if it's in the mildest degree, an encounter with God, an experience that you feel and you know something happened inside of you.
Now, that doesn't mean that you'll be able to interpret the word of God. That's why God gave us the fivefold ministry where we have pastors and teachers and prophets and, and stuff like that that are able to help us. There's the sheep and there's the shepherd. Most people will always be a sheep. They'll never become a shepherd. So a sheep has to follow. And God gave us the fivefold ministry to do that. However, we live in a time and age where Christianity has become so easy for us today with all the different apps and stuff electronically that we receive and the Bibles that now have theologians and scholars explaining to us what each verse means. So if you really want a relationship with God, it, it is so very easy to do so today. However, if someone really wants to become personal with God, it is available, but God is not a cheap God like any other God. You're going to have to get your heart completely sold out to him. And he's going to reveal himself to you. Ever wanted the experience of attending a genuine royal ball? Well, here's your chance. Join Deep Believer Ministries for one of the grandest, most powerful events ever to solely honor King Jesus with a night with the King at the Broadmoor. Enjoy the magnificent grounds, accommodations, and fine dining of the five-star, five-diamond, exquisite Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A Night with the King at the Broadmoor is a very royal, very formal three days, two nights conference that will provide you with hands-on training for true, Christian, supernatural living by renowned teachers and evangelists. This includes training in multiple areas of healing, deliverance, spiritual warfare, how to walk out the abundant Christian life, as well as how to obtain success in finances God's way. Then, for the royal evening, soak in the ambiance of white tablecloth gourmet dining, live brass and stringed instruments, acclaimed Christian singers and worshipers. And what's a royal ball without ballroom dancing? Don't know how? Complimentary ballroom dance lessons are included. A night with the King at the Broadmoor will be a night of complete honor and reverence to our King Jesus and will be like nothing you've possibly ever experienced. We hope to see you there for this stately, eventful night. We've been told this has never been done before. So welcome to a one-of-a-kind opportunity. We're so thrilled to invite you to be a part of something truly special at a night with the King at the Broadmoor a Royal Ball 2024. So whether you're looking to share in the excitement of this joyous occasion or leave your mark on this amazing event, we would love to have you with us. We'd also love to have you as one of our gracious sponsors. Now this is a 100% sponsored event and is only possible because of you and God. Our sponsorship packages are truly amazing from vacation spa and golf stays at the world-renowned Broadmoor to publicize marketing opportunities. We would be honored to have you join us as one of our sponsors. Just head over to www.thenightwiththeking.com and select sponsors to find out more. Now, if being a sponsor really isn't your thing or if you're unable at the moment, but you would still like to contribute, we have another fantastic option for you. For only a donation of $5 or more, whatever you're choosing, you can have your name beautifully written in calligraphy on our framed contributor piece, which will proudly display the names of all the sponsors and contributors to a night with the King at the Broadmoor, a Royal Ball 2024. So to become an individual contributor, just simply visit www.deepbeliever.com and click donate. Then type a night with the King in the comments. This event is truly historical and this framed piece will not only be showcased at this year's event, but also for every year to come, reminding everyone of the incredible people who helped make this happen in honor of our Lord. But wait, there's more. The first 100 contributors will not only have their names beautifully calligraphed on the piece, but will also be entered into a drawing to win two free, that's right, two free tickets to a night with the King at the Broadmoor 2024, including a two night stay with all meals, which are three, and workshops covered from April 1st 
through second. And the excitement doesn't stop there. 24 special contributors out of everyone will be chosen for an exclusive access to our Deep Believer Vault premiering in May 2024, which is a special collection of backstage interviews and unseen videos that has never been shared anywhere else, not even social media. No one else has seen these. And there will also be holding quarterly raffles that you will not want to miss. There'll be prizes everywhere. So if you're ready to join us in making history, become a sponsor by visiting www.thenightwiththeking.com and select sponsors. If you'd rather make an individual contribution of $5 or more, just head over to deepbeliever.com and click donate and mention a night with the king in the comments. Your name will be beautifully displayed on our board for years to come, every year to come, as long as we're having this beautiful event for the Lord. And it starts this year. We'd be so grateful to have you join us on this journey. A portion of our proceeds will be donated to Compassion International, which is an American child sponsorship and Christian humanitarian aid organization. So thank you so much for considering this invitation. Your support means everything to us. Therefore, if we don't see you there, we'll see you here. On to the topic of DNA. You did a wonderful three-part series on it. And a lot of believers, the majority of believers don't understand the power that you have once you are born again. So Pastor Ian, could you do us a favor? Could you break down for us the power of our DNA that God has given us once we have become born again? Okay. So uh, first of all, people have to understand, and this is what I explained in part one. People must accept the fact that almost everything in this world, in our lives, are manipulated by dark spirits. If you cannot bring yourself to that place, then obviously you won't receive all God has for you because you think you're okay. So you must accept the fact that most of the issues in our lives are manipulated and controlled by demons. When you, when you realize that, when you accept that, it forces you to the place where, God, I need for you to come into my life and do something because I am a human being and there's no way I can work or fight against these supernatural beings that are controlling and manipulating my life circumstances. So with, with that said, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born again is not just repeating a prayer. Born again is taking the life that you have, giving it to God and him giving you a new life. It's not something, you see, as a mom, as a dad, husband, wife, we, we are these things and we add daily stuff to our life that eventually becomes a burden, but we remain the same old person. I'm still a dad. I'm still a mom. I'm still a business person, this and that. And then I take this uh, hobby, th th this other career, this other burden, and we add it to our life. When you are going to be a Christian, it's not taking what you already have and adding something to it. It's relinquishing who you are, giving it up completely and receiving something completely different. It's not an add-on. The Bible says you become a new creature. God doesn't build on the old. He, he tells us about that when it comes to the, to, to the wine and the wine skin. Both has to be new. And that was the whole plight with um, the Pharisees and Christ. They didn't understand that. They wanted to keep Judaism and they wanted to try something new. Jesus said that can't work. You got to let go of the old. So to fully get this DNA reset, you must first come to the place where you realize that everything about your old DNA is corrupted. By birth, when you were born, completely corrupted. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. So that old corrupt DNA is like a fountain inside of us that is pushing corruption in every way. There's absolutely no good in it. And that's why scripture says no one is good, not even one. 
everything mm -hmm. about the old DNA that we inherited is completely corrupt. There's no kind of righteousness or godliness flowing, just complete corruption. Jesus said, be born again. So when you really and truly are born again, that old fountain shuts down completely. And there's a new fountain that starts to flow on the inside. And when that new fountain starts to flow, it flows with the very life, nature, character of God, giving you desires that you've never had before. And, and that new fountain will, first of all, give you an awareness of God as a person in, person in a personal relationship and not just a form of entity out there at a distance. Secondly, it's going to make you become passionate, longing for God like you've never longed before. And you can't do this. It's the fountain on the inside from the Holy Spirit that is creating all of this inside of you, making you want God, what God wants, and wanting to live this new life that God has given you. Now, when this born-again experience happens, the Bible teaches us now that our spirit man is resurrected. And within this spirit man comes the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. He comes as the commander in chief of all the power of heaven. He connects with our human spirit that is now resurrected and came alive. And when this happens, he now feeds us and commands us with what God wants us to be and how it can happen. He does this through his word. And when we awaken to this now, the command center is no longer in the DNA of the cells of our body, because the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son, eternal life. So we're not going to receive eternal life. We have already received this eternal life, meaning then that our bodies, our souls will no longer be controlled by the old corrupted blood DNA in our bodies. Really, God has given us now the ability to live by eternal life, which is flowing through us. So this eternal life comes into our spirit. And from within our spirit, scripture starts to give us what God wants our bodies to become and what our souls to become. Now, it is then our duty to take the word of God, so being richly poured into our spirit, and then start to command. The command center change. It's no longer in that old DNA. It's now from our spirit. And God wants us now to take the, the new commands of his word, which is pure life. And he wants us to now speak and declare this word into our body. Where there's sickness, in the name of Jesus, I command my body to be freed from this sickness. Speaking to our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotion. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. So now, as the new commander from the commanding center, we command our mind, be at Peace in the name of Jesus. We command our emotions. Be at peace in the name of Jesus. And so when we got saved and born again, our spirit man came alive, but our soul needs to be restored and our body needs to be restored. And it all happens from the new command center in our spirit. And as we take what the Holy Spirit is feeding us with, we declare that over our body. We declare that over our soul. And in time, that new DNA from heaven infiltrates soul and body. And lo and behold, we are just like Jesus in this world. So you said in your sermon that if we ask for certain things, ask for God to do it. Sometimes we may wait for a long time or it may never happen. Why? Well, God will never do for us what he has already given us the ability to do. In scripture, it outlines that for us. 
whatever is in scripture now belongs to us. It is now ours. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 18, 18, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loose in heaven. We have the permission. We have the authority. So there are certain things that we can pray about. And there are certain things that we should never pray about because there are certain things that we can pray and pray. But if God has already given us the command from his word to do it, then he will never answer that prayer. Okay, so what are some things we shouldn't have to pray about? That's that's very general, but if something is unclear in Scripture, then you pray about it. But if it's outlined clear in Scripture, take, for instance, money. There's a lot of people that pray and pray and pray and pray about money, that God would help them to pay this bill, pay that bill. But if you're a Christian, it is outlined in scripture that you should pay your tithes, that you should give your offering. And God is the one that then, open. listen, that's a whole nother topic by itself. When when I when I got born again, and this is why the, the Lord broke me down after I got born again to where I had nothing Nothing, because the Lord wanted to rebuild his kingdom principle inside of me. I remember the second time I heard the audible voice of God. This was eight and a half years later. The Lord asked me, he said, he didn't ask me, he commanded me. He said, I want you to resign for your job and go full-time ministry. At that time, I was doing ministry, but I only had about 10 people in church and nobody tithed. That was a curse word for them. Nobody gave offering. So how in the world am I going to leave my job and serve God? But because I knew it was his voice that I heard, I went home and I told my wife, she cried over the whole thing because how in the world are we going to live? But thank God, when... After she cried, we both agreed, I'm going to resign. And so long story short, I went to my boss and I said, I'm resigning. I got to go and serve the Lord. He said, what do you mean you're going to resign? He said, is it money you need? We're going to raise your pay. I said, no, I don't need any more money. He said, well, at least wait two more years. If you wait two more years, you're going to get two more thousand dollars on your take home pay. I said, well, that sounds good, but I have to leave now. So I lost $2,000 there. But, but here's what God did. And he was teaching me. I, I, it would take me two years to have an additional $2,000 on my take home pay. I left and I lost 2000 within the same week, the same week I was preaching just a few people, an American couple came to this little dilapidated building. We were preaching and after service, he, he, he put something in my hand and he said, I want you to have this. And when I opened my hand, it was $2,000 in one week. Praise God. Wow. So because so, of your obedience. Exactly. And, and then after the obedience, he taught me biblical principles concerning money. So you don't pray about money. You do what God says to do with money and then money will come. So I hope that's an example, but, but it's biblical. It's from the word. Okay. So you said something else as well that, um, I love, and it goes even deeper how you said that your spirit man learns from Holy Spirit. Could you explain that? The Holy Spirit will never do anything outside of the word of God. It has to be within the word. And I'm sure that you know that people don't realize this, but most Christians read the Bible from their flesh. It's not their spirit man. But when you learn to yield to the Holy Spirit when you read the Bible, he takes what you would normally read and just see as something literal. He turns it into revelation. And that's what happened with this DNA series. You know, I've read these things in the Bible for several years, but all of a sudden, when the Lord quickened my spirit, I started reading these portions of scripture and they were serious revelation to me. And that's why I brought it forth. So we have to learn not to read scripture from, from the flesh, but the spirit. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches you the great mysteries of God. How does your life change? when you start reading the Bible from Holy Spirit as opposed to the flesh, how does your life change when you read it in that way as opposed to reading it from your own intellect, your own you know, way of thinking? 
how does your life change okay. once you begin to interpret it the right way? Yes. So when, when, let me give you this quick example. When, when you read the Bible as a Christian from the flesh, you read and you hardly obey anything. You read it and you continue with your life. When you're reading from your spirit and the Holy Spirit reveals things to you from his word, then you have to obey. Transformation doesn't come just because you're ingesting the word from your spirit. It comes when everything he shows you, you obey him, transformation starts. That's good. That's good. So I'm going to go back to DNA. So when you give your life to Christ sincerely, does your DNA change automatically? Or say if those are listening right now and they're like, okay, maybe I haven't, maybe my DNA hasn't been rebooted. How do you reboot your DNA or when does it actually happen? Yes. So if they listen carefully to the three-part series, it would explain all of that. But no, it in the soul and in the body, it's not an immediate thing. It's not an automatic thing. The spirit person becomes fully, fully righteous once again when you're born again. But based on the commands of the Holy Spirit through his word, as you start to firstly obey what he says to do. And then secondly, as you start to declare from God's word to your soul, mind, emotion, will, and to your body, eventually that DNA inside your soul, your body starts to also become transformed and reset. And when it's reset, does it line up or reline up with the word of God? after that oh uh -huh. oh of course of course your 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 mind now becomes a sanctuary of the glory of god it's no longer controlled by the enemy that the thoughts are not reckless and depressing anymore your emotions are now controlled by the word of god and not by circumstances your body now has to obey that sickness cannot stay on it anymore so there's a huge difference that you feel in the soul and in the body in the process of time. And the quicker you learn by faith to stand on God's word and declare it from the command center of your spirit, that's as quick as the restoration and the reset of the DNA in your soul and body is going to happen. What do you say to those who knows that their DNA has been reset? But they're surrounded by many lukewarm Christians, because I know a lot of people who are suffering this, suffering through this right now, where uh, they believe like you believe, like we believe, and they're surrounded by a lot of lukewarm Christians. But when they get around these people who they have to be around due to probably work or whatever, uh, they feel there's a suppression uh, on their spirit. And they have to be around these people. What would you say to them to help them? Okay. So I think I think Jesus mentioned something about that in John chapter 17. When he prayed to the Father, he said, I am not asking you to take them out of this world, but I am asking you to keep them by your word. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you are working with the devil himself on the job site. If you have a dynamic personal relationship at home daily with your master, when you get on the job site, you're in command, not your situation and circumstance. So Jesus said, don't take them out of the world, keep them by your word. So if you want, if you want to be victorious anywhere you are, you must have the life of God's word being ingested every single day. Nothing. Or, that's why the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But the problem is most Christians don't take care of their personal relationship with God. Therefore, uh, they succumb to their circumstances and their surrounding. So would you say that there are some things that Christians go through that they may not have to go through? Um, absolutely. Like cycles of sickness don't have to go through that. That's something of the past. Financial lack is something of the past. Uh, um, torment 
in the mind. That's a thing of the past. There, there's too many things to count. Because God literally wants us to be new people and he provides, actually he wants us to partake, scripture says, of his divine nature. When Jesus was on the earth, nothing affected him because he was living from the divine nature of his father. And us, if we are conscious that we have been given the divine nature of God, not divinity, but the divine nature of God. We can walk in victory. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't be afflicted. That doesn't mean that, that the enemy won't come against us. But we will win every single time. As a matter of fact, this Sunday in Paradoxes of the Faith, I'm going to be talking about fierce warrior. Christians have to change the mentality that God will do everything for them. God has already done everything. We have to learn to fight and fight hard and well. As I mentioned, there are some things that we don't have to go through and you confirmed it. So a lot of people are going through cycles of, say, poverty, of sickness, of all these things. How do they stop it? I know you touched on it, but could you just elaborate more? Because there are some people who are like, oh my word, this man is speaking to me. The Lord is using this man to speak to me. How do I stop this? I'm tired of being sick if I don't have to. I'm tired of being impoverished if I don't have to. I'm tired of being tormented if I don't have to. How do they stop it? Well, again, first, obedience. Any disobedience opens the door to the enemy anew. So obedience, when the Lord speaks to you through his word or through a minister of the gospel or, or through a, a YouTube preaching, if, if you know the Lord is speaking to you, you obey him. You, you live by the principles of his word. You know, we are emotional beings and we tend to think that when we go to the altar of whatever church we visit, some power preacher that's out there and we have the opportunity to go and visit and they laid hands on us and we felt something, that is good, but that won't change things for you. What will change things for you is living the principles of God's word. Christianity is a kingdom. God gave us his kingdom. Kingdoms are run by principles, not by emotions. So to avoid these cycles of defeat and lack and pain, we find the principles of God's word. We live them. We declare them. And if it doesn't happen now, say it again. Declare it again until you believe it. And it has to change because let God be true and every man a liar. And you know what? There was a woman in your sermon or service. There was a woman in your service who she was deathly ill and she had a near death experience. And when you prayed over her, something happened. Could you just share that? Or do you mind sharing that? Yeah, well, it, actually, there are many, 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 several of them. We've seen cancer healed, diabetes healed, lung problems healed. You know, when I got born again, I was still ignorant. I didn't know the word of God like I do today, but I knew God was up to something. I, I just didn't know he was giving me a ministry of the supernatural. I remember one day a lady, this is several years ago now, a lady came to the altar when I called people up. And the moment I touched her just on her forehead, this lady lift off the ground and was thrown about 15 feet. I didn't understand it then, but I realized the lady was in witchcraft and there was opposing powers and God just lifted her up and flung her across the altar. So I knew God was doing something. Anyway, so that lady that you're talking about, yes, she had two blood clots in her lungs. Her mom is a wonderful Christian. She feared for her very life. She hardly could breathe. And she was in the hospital for about uh, three weeks, I think. Came out very, very weak. Still was coughing, throwing up, could hardly eat. And I went to her home and prayed for her. And then I prayed for her here again. And she is doing much, much better than she was doing. As a matter of fact, she sent me a text a few days ago. And she said, I just need to text you and tell you that what you're doing and what you've done for me and you've prayed for me has helped me tremendously in my life. And I am not going back to the lifestyle I had before. 
she really, really thought she was going to die because she was gasping for breath and almost couldn't breathe even with oxygen tanks and stuff like that. And she said that her life flashed before her. But she didn't have a heaven or hell experience, but she realized that she definitely needed to change her ways. Wow. And then when you came and prayed for her, things just changed. Yes. When, when I left her home after praying for her, her mom said she quit vomiting. She got up, was still weak, but could walk on her own. And, and so her life is progressing quickly for the better. Now, for those who are sick, and they're like, okay, how do I get better? Because, you know, people are told because your family members died of cancer, you have a higher risk of getting cancer. If your family had diabetes or if your family had blood issues, you're going to have that too. So what do you say to those people? Because this, again, goes back to your DNA. What do you say to yes. those who are being told, you know, this is going to happen to you or you need to be more cautious of this because of your ancestry, because of your 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 family? Yeah, well, let me let me say that even as a Christian, that curse is still coming down in the bloodline. A lot of Christians don't believe that, but that is true. You know, you know, something I told because I, I went and ministered deliverance in the south of our country. And I told the people because they didn't. Well, they knew me through social media, but never saw me in person, never experienced my ministry. And I told them, you know, I've been doing deliverance for several years now, and I have never delivered the ungodly. It's all Christians that I've delivered because wow. Christians think that they cannot be with demons, but I have never delivered the worldly or the ungodly. It has all been Christians that I have delivered. So yes, even after being born again, you can still be running with these curses and they're still going to catch up with you, you have to literally break them, renounce them, get the blood of Jesus to cleanse them so that you can be free. Why do you believe that a lot of Christians believe that if you're a Christian, you can't have a curse on you? Two things. Number one, revelation is progressive. What preachers knew 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, is different from what we now have as revelation from Scripture. We live in a day and age where the fullness of revelation is being poured upon us. So to answer the question, the reason why many Christians believe they cannot have demons if they're Christians is because of faulty theology. Preachers that have never been exposed to the supernatural or called to the supernatural, they teach just what they see from Scripture. So it's not the Christian's fault. It's the fivefold ministry fault. Why do you say it's the fivefold ministry's fault? Because remember, fivefold ministry means pastors, teachers, prophets, and all of this. And um there are people in more conservative denominations that will teach the word accurately, doctrinally, but they have not been awakened to the supernatural side of God's word. So Christians by the tons are involved in these ministries and they only learn what pastor teaches them. So would you say that there needs to be an equal balance where you need to know the word and understand that be, being a child of God, you are supposed to walk in a supernatural, or do you think it's okay for you just to be all about the word, not know the supernatural, or all about the supernatural, not know the word? I think God is doing a shift all by himself in these last days, because I personally believe that we're living in a time and age where it's no longer about the generals of the faith. I believe God is raising up just individuals who are not, not even aware of it and, and not even desiring it. And God is pouring out his Holy Spirit in a supernatural way where we're just being awakened as regular individuals to understand that this is no longer just about going to church and, and just living a basic Christian life, that God is now awakening men and women, filling them with their with the Holy Spirit and awakening them to the spiritual world. And you mentioned something that is so powerful. 
I just want you to break this down and explain it. You said that the word if is the biggest word in the English dictionary. Why do you say that? Because much depends on those two letters. If you believe and if you don't believe will depend on what will happen in your life. So it's only two letters, but it will either make you or break you. So could you give us some stories, verses in the Bible where it even displays um, the ifs there? What does the Lord say about if, if? Well, Jesus once mentioned that he could not do much miracle in a certain place because they didn't believe. And the reason they didn't believe is because of that if I have the power to choose. So Jesus said, and here is from Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. If you say to this mountain, you have the choice to say or not say. If you say, you will see. If you don't, you don't see. So it's a small word, but the whole world of the supernatural depends on it. It could change everything. Exactly. Wow. Okay. So, so basically everyone, every believer has an option that we don't really realize that we have. We have options where we could go one way or we can go another based on what we believe or what we submit ourselves to the, or how we submit ourselves to the Lord. Exactly. God will force nothing on you. He will if God is calling you into a deeper walk into the supernatural, he will send many different things from different people. And it's up to you to be awakened to it, to believe it. You can reject it and just remain the way you are. How would you encourage those right now if they're like, OK, I need this reboot? Um, you know, I am born again. But I feel like I'm not there yet. I haven't gotten there, but I'm ready. And, you know, I'm ready for the Lord to change my life. And I'm ready to be a whole new person because our DNA has to match the Lord's, obviously. How do they do that? I can't recommend YouTube as such because there are all kinds of nonsense, really, that is happening on YouTube. But thank God for people like you and your show that have a solid, righteous, spirit-filled men and women um, that God has called. But, but really, if you are a Christian and you intend to be awakened to the supernatural and want to go deeper with God, the first thing you have to check is where you are attending church. And if it, if it is not teaching it, then invite yourself to another church where they're they are operating in the supernatural because it's almost impossible for you to be awakened if you're not around the environment that will wake you up to the supernatural. So get out of the church where you are and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to a church where the Holy Spirit is moving and working powerfully. But what if they're like, I'm in a city where there's no good church. What do you say to those? Because a lot of people are going to online churches or a lot of people just aren't going to church at all. What do you say? Yeah, um, then you you are left with having to connect on social media and pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the true genuine men and women of God and be filled and be awakened to the supernatural through that. Um, but if if sincerely in your heart you are searching for that, the Holy Spirit will never leave you to fall into deception. He will lead you to that correct man or woman of God that is right for you for that time. So another one more question for you. So you mentioned that there are demons in your DNA, right? Or not your DNA, but there are demons in the DNA, you know, when you're born. So when your DNA is changed, who or what is in your DNA? Okay. Now, remember, when you're born again, the command center changes. The focus is no longer on the body, on the blood, on the cells, on the DNA. It's now your spirit enriched with the Holy Spirit and you now taking command. These de in, in, I'm, I'm telling you the revelation from God. Demons are attached to you the moment you're born. 
The moment you're born. Why? Because God has a plan for you and the devil already sees that and he counteracts that. But when you are born again and the Holy Spirit's power and life flows through your spirit into your body and you start to break these curses, these demons releases. They release their hold on your DNA and then you are able to free that up and allow the life of God to go into it. So Pastor Ian, if anyone wanted to know more about you, about your ministry, about deliverance, how can they reach you? Through the WhatsApp that I gave you, or they can tune in into Facebook and YouTube, Living Word Church Belize. And we have uh, two services per week. Our deliverance service is Wednesday night and our regular service is on Sunday. I say regular because on Sunday we have more of our immature people that comes Wednesday night are people that have already been matured and been taught experienced. You know, we're at the place in our Wednesday service where 95% of our people that comes every Wednesday have already been freed. They're enjoying new life, free life. So I'm actually praying that the Lord will start to send more because I love deliverance, but there's hardly anybody left in the sanctuary uh -huh. to free. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. So I'm going to put all that information at the bottom. So if anyone wants to reach Ian Zaldivar, you can do that. And Ian, could you do us a favor? Could you pray for our audience right now? Um, however, the Lord is leading you. Absolutely. Precious heavenly father. In the majestic, glorious name of your son, Jesus Christ, I bring before you every person that will be watching this program. From the moment they have tuned in, it is because you're calling them into a deeper level, into a wholesome Christian life. I pray that you would give them ears to hear un. Plug their spiritual ears. Lord, awaken their spiritual heart. And as they hear, as they listen, Lord, I pray that your glory through that heart that has already been yielded, there will be an encounter that will launch them into a dynamic, glorious life with Jesus. Because, Master, you died for them to experience this. You hate the fact that they're living beneath their rights. So I pray, reach out to them. The moment they connect and they start to listen, let there be a stirring within their spirit, Lord, that will cause them to have an encounter with you that will have their Christian life come to a place where it will never be the same again. You will become more real to them than they have ever known you to be. Lord, bless them. Bless them in every way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen and amen. Ian Zaldivar, thank you so much for this interview. It is powerful. I mean, I'm, I'm praying and I know that when people watch this, not only will their lives be changed, but how they see the Lord will change and how they see themselves will change through Christ. So I just want to thank you once again. Amen. Thank you for having me. It's been such a delight. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, Get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.